Good morning. Today's class is directed towards the question as to what was the status of women during the Enlightenment? And did it undergo any significant change during this period? Now, uh, I will, of course, address this question through the prism of reason that the Enlightenment sought to project for itself and uh, talk about uh, the emancipatory nature of the Enlightenment and its impact on women in uh, general. And we will uh, frame the hypothesis that while the women, uh, I'm sorry, while the Enlightenment meant a significant transformation in the lives of men, the Enlightenment did not uh, shower its, uh, its blessings of liberty, as it were, on women to that extent. Now, uh, we will, of course, begin with the state of uh, women just prior to the Enlightenment, especially uh, the Renaissance and uh, before. And we let, we'll begin by taking a look at the legal structure within which uh, the woman had really no legal authority excepting when she was widowed. Uh, by marriage, it was uh, the, the law said that by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law, right? So the body of the undivided family, as it were, this is the leading jurist, William Blackstone, is saying that is the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of her husband. So the woman, as it were, had no separate judicial existence or identity, as it were. And uh, the, the woman could not let, set, sell, give away, or alienate anything without her husband's consent. Right. And therefore, you have that very famous uh, poem uh, which was written by an anonymous poet, but uh, talked about the precise condition of women. In youth, a father's stern command and jealous eyes control her will. A lordly brother watchful stands to keep her closer captive still. The tyrant husband next appears with awful and contracted brow. No more a lover's form he wears. Her slaves become her sovereign now. So it talks about the kind of power that the man wielded over uh, the woman. In 1779, William Alexander, in his comprehensive history of women, wrote, we allow a woman to sway our scepter, obviously referring to the queens, but by law and custom, we debar her from every other government, but that of her own family. Very interestingly, what Alexander is also doing is looking at the limitations that uh, were imposed upon women in terms of their employment, as if there were not a public employment between that of superintending the kingdom and the affairs of her own kitchen which could be managed by the genius and capacity of women. So the irony that while you actually uh, delegate the woman to rule the kingdom, you act, do not give her sway over anything else other than her kitchen. Right. Now, uh, that uh, is one part of the story. But uh, there were, of course, uh, an entire body of literature that uh, talked about the behavior of women. And this was the literature of the conduct book. You will find the re references to the literature of the conduct book in the fictions of uh, Samuel Richardson, of course. But the conduct book, I need to emphasize, was a very powerful medium through which the duty of the woman, the wife, the daughter was uh, a kind of... Uh, reiterated and reiterated in society. In 1688, here is the Earl of Halifax writing a letter to his daughter. And he says, 
that there is inequality in the sexes and that for the better economy of the world, the men who were the lawgivers had the larger share of reason bestowed upon them. And this is the point that I want to bring in. I, I will repeat that quotation. Uh, there is inequality in the sexes and that for better economy of the world, the men who were the lawgivers had the larger share of reason bestowed upon them. Now, henceforth, from 1688 onwards, you can see that Locke is just around the corner. The entire discourse about women would shift towards this question of reason and learning. It's very important also because Locke was writing some thoughts on education and pleading for some amount of education and rationality for women. Locke is an interesting figure in that context. But henceforth, the debate around women would center around learning. Earlier, this debate was not about reason and learning. So the question now became, did the woman, woman have reason? If so, if she had reason, then how would that reason be applied and useful in society? So the question of, uh, you know, uh, of the status of women changed to a significant degree. Uh, and then you have Lord Chesterfield, for example, to whom uh, Johnson wrote his letter protesting against patronage. And look at this sort of cavalier tone that Lord Chesterfield used. He said, uh, they have an entertaining tattle referring to women and sometimes wit. But for solid reasoning, good sense, I never in my life knew one that had it or who reasoned and acted consequentially for four and 20 hours together. So the patriarch and the very obviously the classed gentleman suggested that women had no reason at all. In fact, uh, there was this entire debate about the body of the woman and her menstrual circle cycle and uh, her nervous system. So discourse after discourse talked about how the woman's constitution was fundamentally different and that because she had a menstrual circle, she cycle, I'm sorry, she could not keep a control over her bodily fluids. Now, this thesis was extended to the thesis that therefore she did not have a control over her nervous system and therefore she was prone to tears and sensibility. This was a rampant discourse throughout the 18th century that the woman, as it were, leaked from all her uh, bodily parts and that she was prone to hysteria. This is one, one important uh, argument that was offered. She was prone to hysteria, nervous breakdowns, tears, and of course, she was prone to the uh, bodily fluids in her menstrual cycle. Now, this, of course, created a backlash of sorts also. But I'll come to that in a later, uh, at a later time in the class. Uh, but I want you to understand and see how the woman's body uh, was construed as a kind of an object which uh, naturally defied reason, right? So rationality was all about control, all about the proper application of the senses, while the woman was seen as naturally sort of inimical to uh, rationality, uh, in fact, uh, therefore prone to uh, giving up to desire. In fact, uh, Pope had these very significantly misogynistic lines where he argued that most women had no character at all, right? And uh, this strain of misogynistic reduction of the woman uh, was, as it were, at the root of a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of debates around uh, around the status of the woman. If the woman really did not possess reason, should she be given education, or should she? What kind of power would she have? Uh, and why was women or education important for the women? Did this discourse about sensibility, about emotions, about the lack of 
control over her own body really hold good? Now, one of the most important, uh, one of the most, and therefore, I'm sorry, therefore, women during this period started demanding post lock and post this entire debate about education. Now, why is lock important here? Because lock was not only talking about rationality, but he was talking about rationality, which was to be distributed to all the spheres. And therefore, he argued that the first sphere in which rationality should be distributed should be the education system. And therefore, instead of the tyrannical education on women, which uh, I'm sorry, on children, which was based on discipline, Locke argued for a more tolerant, more rational, more participatory form of education. And uh, I am personally working on a paper here, uh, and I am looking at the ways in which several new kinds of schools were coming up, where you know the pattern of education was gradually changing. But that's a different topic. Now, women naturally stake the claim to this education, being denied uh, of its effects. And here we have Hannah Moore, who in 1779 uh, wrote a treatise called Strictures on the Modern System of Female Education. And she held, interestingly, this is a woman writing, that the education of girls should be to make them good daughters, good wives, good mistresses, good members of society, and good Christians. Uh, interesting, very interesting in the sense that, you know, this is another argument that Mary Wollstonecraft would also later on use. Now, Sir William Hamilton, for example, one of the one of the more enlightened earls, uh, alerted his niece that a lady's being learned is commonly looked upon as a great fault and sort of advised her, keep your knowledge of Latin a dead secret. Having said that, there were voices, very strong voices of women which emerged at the middle of the century. And these included two very significant figures. Uh, incidentally, both of them were Marys. You know, the 18th century was filled with, uh, you know, protesting women who were all, you know, Marys in the sense. The first of them was Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, uh, who actually was a remarkably educated, enlightened woman, self-educated, mind you. And uh, therefore, she traveled all across uh, the continent and especially visited Turkey, where she saw the women wearing the veil. Now, Mary Wortley Montegu also saw the system of inoculation there against smallpox. And she brought back this system of inoculation and tried to start in England. Therefore, you see, there were enlightened women, but all of them belonged to the gentry. Very few people actually belonged to the common classes. The common women did not have access to education. And by their privileged position of classes, many of these women gained education, literacy, and participated in social reform. But they were few and far between. Now, Mary Margaret Cavendish, for example, one of these very important women wrote and protested, said, we live and die uh, as if we were produced from beasts rather than from men. And he said, she said, there's no part of the world where our sex is treated with so much contempt as England, which was probably untrue because it's in England, there was initiated a debate about the condition of women in general. Just give me a moment. Uh, I will switch on my uh, laptop. Right. Thank you. Now, uh, very interestingly, this was uh, in contrast with uh, the general winds of liberty that were floating around England. Now, Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, 
whom I was referring to, had a very interesting take. And she said that, yes, English women are oppressed and that Turkish women are much more liberated. Why? Because they have the veil. Now, you might balk at this, but she said that Turkish women can move around without being identified and vilified because the veil is a perpetual masquerade which gives them entire liberty follow, of following their inclinations without danger of discovery. Now, a rather convoluted argument. Many of you would disagree with that, uh, as do I, because the veil is ultimately also a very great symbol of uh, male oppression. But interestingly, Mary Wortley Montagu was suggesting that women cannot move in England. In At least in Turkey, they have the veil to conceal themselves and they go about and have their interactions without the fear of discovery. But Lady Mary Wortley Montagu stands out at this point of time as a woman educated, as a woman liberated, a woman who traveled, one who went into the harem of Turkey and one who was claiming for herself not only some degree of agency, but also in general freedom for women. Now, this tendency of resentment was reiterated in a number of works. Here is Judith Drake, who wrote essay in defense of the female sex. This was published as early as 1600. And 96. And he says that uh, nothing about women can be learned from books. He said, All of you are agree arguing that women are uneducated, irrational, but you know nothing about women. Why? Because their authors were typically men. And as men are parties against us, their evidence may justly be rejected. And therefore, she was claiming, and this is one of the first voices of equality, all souls are equal and alike, and that consequently, there is no distinction as male and female souls. How falsely we are deemed by the men to be wanting in that solidity of sense, which they so vainly value themselves upon. Our souls are as perfect as theirs. And the organs they depend on are generally more defined. Now, that is a fabulous argument if you look at it. He's, she's bringing three things together. She says, first and foremost, we have equal amount of sense. Secondly, our souls, therefore, are equal. And thirdly, our organs are much more refined. So the physical body, the soul, and the rational capacity are all brought into her defense. This is Judith Drake essay in defense of the female sex, 1696. Now, interestingly, what this meant, this demand of uh, a change towards women was actually bringing around, and this is something which you must understand, a very significant change in the way in which marriage was looked at. Now, if you look at the word husband, for example, comes from the word husband, lord of the house or lord of the manor. Now, the husband had absolute control over the body of the wife. It was not just merely about property, you see. The husband, for example, had the right to beat his wife, just as the way in which a father had the right to beat his children. Right. And therefore, marriage was seen as a relationship between inequals, right, in which the man had the power and the woman was completely dominated by her. So this question of female selfhood in marriage was absent, as was her judicial identity. Now, towards the century, turn of the century and beyond, 
this idea of marriage started to change idea of marriage and family how did it change we were moving as and this is something which lawrence stone family and sex uh, in england writes about the uh, lawrence stone who is one of the most important historiographers in this area talks about the rise of two things one is effective individualism effective is a f f e c t i v e effective individualism and the other is the comp is the idea of the companionate marriage effective individualism where the man would have his emotions for the woman right and would not balk at showing it so the man who would be sentimental and filled with sensibility the man of feeling and also that the wife would not be just a subject of the man but also in genuine terms a companion so if you look at and if you take a small amount of trouble and take a look at some pictures by or paintings by hogarth you know it's titled uh, graham children you will find this idea of the husband and the wife going out to public places together you know she being a companion to him and the children are monitored not by excessive discipline but by parental sympathy and sensibility now please understand this this is a very fundamental shift in terms of the marital relationship as well as the parental relationship right now this idea of the pay, of the wife as companion and the wife as companion also not only in the private sphere but also in the public world let's say you can take the wife everywhere and secondly the idea of you know being a friend to the child and disciplining him through reason rather than through the stick was something that was for the first time floated as an idea now th did that mean that women uh, that men started or stopped beating their wives or disciplining their children with the stick no but the idea was gradually coming into being that the man could be sentimental and filled with emotions and that it was perfectly okay to have this entire concept of the sympathetic family and uh, and the uh, and the way of bringing up the child rationally right so from a position of tyranny the relationship between the man and the wife would be changed uh in fact the german writer uh, uh in fact then he was uh, a prussian visitor uh, von archibalds archeholds actually wrote that husband and wife are always together and share the same society in england so he was taken aback and he said it is the rarest thing to meet the one without the other so obviously at the middle of the century husband and wife were going her out in polite society together it is the rarest thing to meet the one without the other they pay all their visits together it would be more ridiculous to do otherwise in england than it would be to go everywhere with your wife in paris so obviously england was showing the way and taking your wife out in society was considered to be polite rather than uh, you know impolite and that the husband uh, that with the husband the wife was stepping out into the public sphere and therefore it is very important that the women were given some form of education so at the middle of the century not only women but many men were also demanding that women be given education and that it was seen very importantly to be a boorish husband or to be a violent husband 
to be a tyrannical husband was out of fashion, right? And you can see this in uh, the figure, say, for example, Lovelace in uh, Richardson's uh, Clarissa, for example, is seen as a kind of a villain rather than the rakish hero. In fact, uh, one of your texts, Tom Jones, I will point out how Squire Western in Tom Jones is going to be this tyrannical father who is set off against Squire Allworthy, who is the more rational parent. And Squire Western is, as it were, rejected in society. Now, the other thing that was happening, and therefore in the continent as well as in England, is that women were also stepping out into some public spaces. And therefore, we have, for example, a woman called Moll King, not the pickpocket, mind you, a woman called Moll King who started a coffee house for women. Now, this is not a mean achievement in the sense that women were now taking part in public debates as well. And this is one of the most significant, uh, I would say, developments of the period that they were commenting they were taking part in these newly affordable uh, and uh, available public spaces. In France, for example, these were salons where women could go and participate equally. And there were very often these association of women. They were called monasteries, but not monasteries in the religious sense of the term, but places where women could go and actually interact with other women. So a public space for women were gradually growing up, right? There were few uh, uh, mixed uh, coffee houses as well. But uh, again, urban women walked about freely, unveiled, and for the most part, unchaperoned. So this was a major change that came across during the Enlightenment. Now, uh, interestingly, there are questions which were discussed in the coffee houses, for example. 1770s, the question was discussed as to whether the clause of obedience in marriage ceremony binds a wife to obey her husband at all times. So even periodicals were debating this notion of women. And you see, when we studied the spectator papers, or we did not probably together, in one of these spectators, spectator number 10, Addison, for example, talks about including the fair sex, that's women, as part of his readership. Because it is important also to bring philosophy out of closets and libraries to dwell among clubs and coffee houses. And women were an important part of this readership. So not only women, but even men were acknowledging that women had the right to step out, had the right to participate in public debates, and that you know they had to be given education and rationality. Now, these were a tiny minuscule of the population, part of the population, but this idea was anyways coming to the forefront. Very importantly, one of the other developments was that women were more literate now. In fact, as I keep on pointing out, this is probably the greatest development that took place for women during the 18th century, that female literacy jumped by approximately 400% between 1650 and 1750. And it rose from 1750 to 1800 by almost 800%. So suddenly you had a huge corpus of women who were literate. Now, just because they were literate did not mean they were enlightened. But many of them started reading these ideas, philosophies, very importantly, novels. Now, it is here that I come to this question of literature, as it were, because 
by the turn of the century, 1680s onwards, women started writing. You know, you have to understand that very few professions actually existed for women. Women could be at the very lowest level maids and prostitutes. Women could be, <coughs> you know, these midwives who had a profession in the sense that they gave birth or, or helped in giving birth. I'm sorry, not gave birth. And for the first time, they entered the publishing industry with a vengeance as publishers, booksellers, even hawkers, and of course, writers. And you have this fair triumvirate of wit called Afra Ben, who wrote in the late 17th century, Mary Delarivier Manley, who wrote The New Atlantis in 1705, and of course, the greatest author of them all, the women author at least, and that is Eliza Haywood. All of them were writing a form of fiction called amatory fiction, which talked about a young woman who stepped into the public sphere, who underwent or who experienced sexual copulation and moved around in society. And these novelettes were actually records of their erotic experiences. Now, obviously, these were directed to, not towards men only. These were also directed towards women. So it created a kind of a paradox within a constrained society. Here was a woman writing about female desire to be circulated among women readers. The backlash was phenomenal, but the popularity was also equally phenomenal. You see, we talk about Defoe, we talk about Fielding, but I keep on harping that Eliza Haywood at this point of time was selling Defoe, Fielding, Swift, Stern, all taken together, right? Now, and Eliza Haywood actually started writing something called The Female Spectator. Now, all these novels ultimately ended by, you know, the woman being pregnant or the woman withdrawing. But the very possibility of a woman experiencing sexual agency was something that was uh, unheard of at this point of time. And there was a mad rush among women to read this. And therefore, you know, there was a tremendous backlash by men. And novel reading became a kind of a kind of an anathema for men that was polluting women. So when you studied your rivals, and when you talked about Mrs. Malaprop, you know, shouting about the circulating library as a diabolical tree of knowledge, Mrs. Malaprop was actually talking about these women and the way in which they were polluting society. Therefore, what did the men novelists do? They accepted the form, they adapted the form, appropriated it, and turned it inside out. So instead of a woman of desire, you now have a virtuous woman in Pamela, or for that matter, a more virtuous woman in Sophia. But the question of the woman who could have some agency in print culture, who did participate in writing novels and fictions about independent women, gave a tremendous push to this notion of women in the 18th century. So three directions are emerging. One, a direction which comes from Locke, where women are demanding rationality and a certain degree of companionship in marriage and therefore education. Two, a direction propelled by upper class women who are demanding that they be given some form of independence and education. And three, women's participation in the public sphere and in the print sphere, which is creating a space where women for the first time are recording their experiences, circulating them, sharing them, and claiming sexual and uh, literary agency. So these are some of the fundamental changes that 
were taking place. Now, many of you, of course, and all of us, in fact, in this uh, syllabus, we do not talk about them. I used to teach Eliza Haywood's Phantomin at one point of time, but you know we can't have everything in the syllabus. But pl please remember this: that you know, women, the rise of the women author as such took place at the end of the 18th, 17th century and gradually deepened into the 18th century, so that numerous best-selling authors were women. Let me name a few, Elizabeth Hamilton, for example, Amelia Opie, Maria Edgeworth, Mary Brunton, Jane and Anna Mary, Maria Porter, and of course, people like Elizabeth Inchbald at the end of the century, uh, Francis Burney, who emerged as one of the most powerful authors of the period, Fielding's uh, sister, Sarah Fielding, all of them emerged during the middle of the century. So from Afraben, De La Revere, Manley, and Eliza Haywood, towards, you are moving towards a glut of women authors who were talking about women, their experiences, and therefore a new voice seemed to surge in print culture about the condition of women, the demand for rationality of women, and the sensibility of the woman. Therefore, this is the this is the mid-century, which is providing a very powerful voice to the woman. And it is in this context that you need to understand your Jane Austen, right? Because Jane Austen did not suddenly come out from thin air. She was the product of a century of writers who were women. Now, uh, this is very importantly, uh, Another thing which was going on at the same time was uh, yesterday I mentioned the concept of anatomy. And you see, this very interesting uh, notion of women as an, a human, and the study of science also provoked something else. And this I need to tell you is that women were not necessarily inferior. So far, there had been this idea that women had inferior rationality and their bodies leaked and their bodies were inferior towards than men. Now, with the rise of anatomy, with the rise of the study of the reproductive organs like the uterus, for example, and the ovary, for example, there was a gradual recognition that women were not inferior, but they were fundamentally different. But this generated another debate. And this debate was the debate on motherhood. And this is a debate in which Mary Wollstonecraft participated in a very big way. But you see, one of the thrusts of the period was that the female body was therefore directed towards or had a primary aim of uh, ensuring motherhood, right? Anatomical structures. Uh, now raise this question as to whether women, the fundamental duty of women were to bear children and educate children. And this incidentally came through in the figure of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now Rousseau is very paradoxical in the sense when uh, he talks about women. On the one hand, this great harbinger of liberty for all classes, when it came to the education of women, you know, it was a rather conservative and extremely restricted education that he had for Emil. And once again, this question of childbirth and the rearing of children became an issue for, uh, for, for Rousseau. And Rousseau's uh, treatise, in the sense, uh, is, uh, is somewhat, you know, not somewhat, extremely antithetical to his uh, general cause for liberty, right? <clears throat> now, uh, Rousseau is fundamentally arguing that the woman is the protectress of the race. She has to bear children and she has to uh, sort of uh, train worthy children and worthy daughters, as it were. Uh, and uh, very interestingly, you know, Rousseau's 
Rousseau's entire thesis seemed to be centered around very limited and restricted access for women, although uh, although Emil did have the, uh, the, the role of education, as it were. But uh, very interestingly, uh, the, the woman who actually sort of uh, claimed, uh, claimed agency for women where was a woman called Mary Astle. And Mary Astle, in her treatise, which was titled Some Restriction Upon Marriage. Remember, this is 1700, almost a century earlier than Wollstonecraft. Uh, repudiated the tame, submissive, and depending temper of those women who find themselves born for slavery. Right. So she is comparing women and the status of women to those of slaves. And Mary Astle is arguing that if all men are born free, how is that that all women are born slaves? Right. And therefore, the woman had the, uh, the right to protest. Mary Astle, of course, did not take this to a very large extent. But Astle's claim, therefore, was that women needed better education so as to ensure and enhance their development as moral and spiritual agents. And Astle wrote that cultivation of the mind was a right for the woman. Right. So, this is, I would say, one of the first major voices which recognized the tyranny of men, compared women to slaves, and claimed both reason and education for herself. Right. Now, I will, of course, bring this uh, uh, lecture to a conclusion, of course, with the woman who, who became a very important figure uh, a, a text which all of you know becomes the first, as it were, proto-feminist text, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792, by Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, Mary Wollstonecraft was responding to this idea about this woman of sensibility, about the idea that the woman was all about sensibility, that sensibility was the dominant aspect of the woman. And therefore, Mary Wollstonecraft suggested that women were equally blessed with the capacity of reason. That is a first argument. The second is that since women have this facility of rationality, therefore, she must be given female education. But Wollstonecraft's thesis is conservative in a different way because she's not claiming education just for herself or for the woman but she is acknowledging that the woman is important as a mother and therefore it is in the rearing of children that women should be given the right to education so it's not that you know a lot of theorists have talked about wollstonecraft's you know, feminist inclinations. But Mary Wollstonecraft is not claiming rationality for the woman just for herself. But she's also taking on a kind of a patriarchal dictum that women have to rear the children. And she's claiming this reason in a roundabout way that women have to raise children. And to raise good children, women must not be denied education. And that uh, she's pleading that one half of society cannot be uh, put into uh, darkness. Wollstonecraft argues that women are kept in ignorance under the specious name of innocence. Right. So that is a very powerful statement that she's making. And that uh, men only sought in them docility, good humor, and flexibility, virtues incompatible with any vigorous exertion of intellect, right? So Wollstonecraft is claiming 
that this idea or framing of the of the of the uh, image of the woman as docile and entirely submissive is antithetical to intellect and what were we created for she asks to remain it it may be said innocent they mean in a state of childhood right so wollstonecraft is comparing the state of lack of education to that of uh, a kind of a demeaning childhood and she's claiming that they be given education therefore she writes still society is very differently constituted parents i fear will still insist on being obeyed because they will be obeyed and therefore for the first time you see that wollstonecraft is calling as it were for a revolution of female manners so in a certain context you see wollstonecraft's politics is revolutionary in that sense but uh, within wollstonecraft this direction of how this revolution can take place is uh, is not uh, really clear but taking wollstonecraft's argument here is Anna Barbold in a poem in 1795 titled The Rights of Women, claiming, Yes, injured women, rise, assert thy right, woman, too long degraded, scorned, oppressed, rise in rebellion. Right. So you have for the first time uh, this idea, O oh, born to rule impartial laws despite resume thy native empire over thy breast so a clarion call by the end of the century is going out about the right of the woman to be educated 1799 once again mary robinson another major writer of the period rallies her women uh, rallies the women saying shake off the trifling glittering shackles which disable you uh, let your daughters be liberally, classically, philosophically, and usefully educated. You see, that's a very, very powerful statement. Liberally, classically, philosophically, and usefully educated. Uh, please remember that even in 1824, when you know James Mill is writing his essay on government, uh, he will exclude women from education. So, you know, this urgent voice for female education at the end of the century was not really heard till the mid 19th century also. And as you know, it was only in the early 20th century that universal adult suffrage uh, would be granted. Now, uh, therefore, let me, I, I have circulated a lot of ideas today and let me bring this to a kind of a close and see what it meant and what did the enlightenment mean for woman and that was a question that i started with now i will argue that the search for liberty the new way of looking at life did make some changes for women it happened in three fundamental ways. One is that the birth or the growth of a rapid public sphere meant that men also recognized, including Locke, Addison, and the major philosophers, that women too could not be ignored and that one part of society could not progress without the other. Therefore, an important call was made to provide a degree of, if not freedom, autonomy to women. Their education was looked at in certain details. Women additionally participated in the public sphere and especially in print culture. And this provoked this rise of uh, the question, the woman question started to be debated to people like Mary Wortley Montego, Mary Astle, and of course, Mary Wollstonecraft. If this was the theoretical debate, then putting forward the woman's subjective uh, feelings, ideas, 
was forwarded through numerous novelists writing in this period and this and these novelists played an important part in uh, forwarding or in foregrounding the consciousness of the woman women demanded education women demanded a degree of freedom but that was largely lacking during the period we observe in 1795 therefore women pleading for more education pleading that they and this education was sought not merely for themselves but for bringing up their children so the enlightenment the degree of liberty that the enlightenment provided to men was lacking in terms of women although ideas were being floated women during the enlightenment remained largely oppressed but the participation in the public sphere the establishment of coffee houses the demand of a certain literary agency were provoking and providing certain avenues through which they could make their claim for reason felt. This is point number one. Point number two is that the idea of marriage was gradually changing. And the idea of the sensib of the man of sensibility or the man of feeling. And the idea of companionate marriage with effective individualism was gradually gaining and gaining a lot of traction and that therefore you know uh, the while the century did not suddenly undergo a rapid change new ideas about marriage the woman's entry into the public sphere were being handled and circulated anatomically this idea of the woman as you know, not in control over her bodily parts was gradually disappearing. And therefore, a major advancement was being made in, in terms of medicine, not medicine, in terms of the female anatomy, as it were. So understanding women, granting them a new place in society and questioning what the status of the woman would be in the home and in the public sphere was a subject that the enlightenment did take up. But when it came to women, the radicalism of the enlightenment was noticeably shallower and without any great development. Questions about women circulated changes were made but in terms of the status of women the enlightenment remained rather conservative right it is with that therefore that i am uh, bringing this discussion to a close and stopping the recording now i will take your questions